Welcome to the Simpleton Podcast, where we discuss all the problems in the world and start a few more. Welcome, Laura Heeman. Thank you, Clark Massey. We have a lot to do today, Laura. Let me give you a quick rundown of this roadmap. Um, we're going to talk about some feedback from a listener and former Simple House missionary on the meaning of heretic, separatist, and schismatic. We're also going to talk about the anniversary celebrations of Simple House, and then we're going to get into the meat, which is the social doctrine of the church. We're going to address it in three ways. We're going to ask, why did it take the church 1,900 years to decide it needed a social doctrine? Um, what actually is the social doctrine to the extent you can do a flyover of it? And what are the blind spots or growth edges of the social doctrine? And then we'll end with a recommendation from Laura Heeman. Great. All right. Uh, our friend Jess Barnes had some interesting thoughts. Um, she shared some stuff from canon law and the catechism and uh, something by Pope Benedict that was like, if you are born into like a wrong set of ideas, like say you're a Protestant and you are born in, as a Protestant and you're not actively contradicting the church, you just kind of were born into a teaching that contradicts the church, you're actually not a heretic. And you're not a separatist or a schismatic, like kind of the, it's a special sin to, in a sense, be in the church and start denying the yeah. church. But if you are already outside the church and like, aren't ever making the active decision to deny it, then you're actually not a schismatic or a heretic. Yeah. So that's a correction from a couple episodes ago. I right. think I just brought, yeah. I was, we were trying to, we were discussing this idea of these new kind of like schismatic Catholic churches arising and trying to compare them to Protestants and saying they were both heretics. Yeah. But actually it's a little bit more tricky than that. Being a new schismatic actually could make you a heretic, but being an old schismatic and born into it doesn't. Yeah. I, I don't have a great, any, it's just interesting that they pointed out there is like a, almost like a moral difference in the position. Yeah. Um, I know, don't have any big takeaway. <laughs> One of, I feel like my, so my grandmother uh, who is still alive is like um, a very saintly person um, and just her whole life, like being around her is like a formation in the Christmas Christian life, but of like points that she like very specifically hammered. One was like, it's a grave sin to leave the church if you're already a Catholic. Right. But I just remember her saying that a lot. We're <laughs> talking around. Right. That. It kind of goes with what Jesus was saying that like, you're kind of more at fault if you have the truth. Yeah. And that's interesting also because it's like if you are Protestant and you get married in your Protestant church and then become Catholic or whatever, or or you don't become Catholic, the, the church recognizes your marriage as valid. But if you're Catholic and get married outside the church, um, it's an invalid marriage. That's interesting. Yeah. One of the texts that Jess sent me was like that it is actually correct to call Protestants brothers in Christ. You know, and that they yeah, deserve yeah. the name Christian. And I thought that I, was kind of an interesting observation. I guess I've always thought of <laughs> my Protestant friends that way, but I never wondered if it was right, you know, what the church I, said same about here, that. So, same here. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I treat Protestants that way too, but yeah. which is interesting to see it as kind of an, an official catechism. Yeah. That's cool. Type That's statement, neat. So. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. We also, uh, my family just came back from uh, Washington, D.C., um, first time I ever got to meet the Hyattsville community at the 20th anniversary of Simple House celebration in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you think it went? I, I, I got good reviews. So <laughs> good. <laughs> what do you think of our food? That was, that was the main yeah. part I was in charge of. <laughs> and, and that is the most important part, good. right? It was good, right? <laughs> <laughs> it was good. I, I thought yeah. the best feedback was one of our current missionaries said, this felt like a very simple house event and yeah. meaning like felt like a family event, felt like a good event. Yeah. Um, I think there were things that we could improve upon, which is convenient. Because there's oh, going to be because we're going to have another anniversary party. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Bishop Johnston and Abbot Benedict are con are celebrating the mass for Simple House on May 6th in Kansas City at St. Anthony's Catholic Church. Please come. Please bring a friend. Uh, and you don't. It's not a potluck. That was a big yeah. confusion in the DC one. You yeah. don't have to. You bring don't food. need to buy a ticket, and you don't need to bring food. But if you want to RSVP on our website, we'd appreciate it. That is it. helpful. <laughs> but there's going yeah. to be, bring your kids. There's going to be inflatables, games, face painting, all the cool stuff. Mm -hmm. All the stuff you want out of a party, like glow yeah. sticks. Yeah. 
All right. Yeah. All right. Let's now endeavor into the social doctrine. Okay. We're going to talk about why did it take the church 1900 years to create a social doctrine? What actually is the social doctrine and what are the growth edges or are there any blind spots that we, in our opinion, believe there are in the social doctrine? So let's get on that. I think the way we're going to address this is I'm going to give a short synopsis of how the social doctrine came about. And then Laura is going to comment at the end, but I'm going to try to kind of give a brief history of the situation. All right. In this history, let's start with the compendium of social doctrine, which we'll talk more about later, which is kind of the official summary of social doctrine. It says why the social doctrine came about. It says the industrial revolution presented for the church, a critical challenge to which her social magisterium responded forcefully and prophetically affirming universal validity and perennially relevant principles in support of workers and their rights. For centuries, the church's message was addressed to agricultural societies characterized by regular cyclical rhythms. This is interesting. This is something in our history that I don't think we think enough about. Um, Around the year 1800 was in the midst of what is the Industrial Revolution. And the changes in the Industrial Revolution are hard to overstate. Mm -hmm. I don't think people realize the seriousness of that change. For example, humans have existed as humans for about 300,000 years. That's just kind of, if you Google it, that's what comes up. Mm -hmm. All right. It took us 300,000 years to get 1 billion people on our planet. In the last 200 years, we took that 1 billion to 8 billion. And I don't say that as like a oh no, population explosion problem. Mm -hmm. I say that as almost a miracle of life. That like 200 years ago, we had a lot of famines and things, barely supporting 1 billion. And somehow we've created a life support system on our planet for 8 billion people. And there appears to be room for more. You know, that is a very interesting, tremendous change in our world. Another example of this change is at the beginning is it took us 1500 years to get through like the Bronze Age. It took us longer than that to get through the Bronze Age. It took us 150 years to get from the age of sail to space travel. You know, that is how fast things are moving. So think about the implications of that. That means that environmental destruction can happen so much more quickly. It means that social changes, like everything that we think of as like this different moral debates happening in our society right now, it's about sexual ethics and everything else can happen so much more quickly. Um, health and medicine have improved. Tech has improved so quickly and the population has expanded so quickly. So this massive acceleration really changed humanity, right? And it was first the secular world who realized this. Um, you start seeing the birth of the social sciences. Like in case you don't know this, you know, like, the disciplines of things like economics, sociology, like the different social sciences were not very developed and weren't really separate departments in a university until, you know, really about 125 years ago is when they started to really appear. Um, but really those disciplines were starting to take off in the industrial revolution. I think one of the most important of which is social welfare. And that's kind of a field that Simple House cares a lot about because we both deal with a lot of people in so who work in the social welfare systems. And in a way, we are also doing some social welfare work. But social welfare is a change in perspective to everything before it, right? Like the church has had plenty of witnesses, the St. Francis of the world, who will stop and serve the leper or stop and serve Bill at the side of the road. But what they didn't do is they never asked questions about what about Bill's people? What about the whole systemic problems associated with this, right? The secular world was the first to ask that question, and that's the field of social work, right? And they were asking that because of this mass agricultural migration from the country to the city during the Industrial Revolution that they were having problems they had never had before, you know? And Karl Marx, I used to you know, when you're taught about Karl Marx, even in high school, you're kind of taught that he thought that social work or only charitable activity was merely like kind of to um, delay the revolution and mm -hmm. like just to uh, acquiesce these masses, but not really dealing with the real problem. And almost like it was a selfish act. It basically, he says it's a selfish activity of the ruling class to keep their power. Right. 
when I heard that from Karl Marx, I thought that is the most um, pessimistic view of human motivation I have ever heard in my life. You know, Mm -hmm. like it just can't be that we're that bad. Like everyone I know does charitable work, not for that reason. Right. But if you go back and read the early social welfare authors, they say that's their motivation. Like Karl Marx was actually kind of nailing it, that that was a motivation for that early social work was to prevent revolution in England during Mm -hmm. the industrial revolution. So I I think that's kind of interesting. I want to say one more thing. Well, maybe two more things before we invite a big general conversation about this. What is the big change that allowed our planet to go from 1 billion to 8 billion people to support that population? Is the change fundamentally that we invented something like a new form of agriculture or invented maybe 10 different things? Or is the change actually more fundamental than that? And I believe it's more fundamental than that. I think the change that the industrial revolution that caused the industrial revolution and caused this incredible acceleration in human history is decentralization and um, harnessing incentive structures. So essentially, instead of things coming from the top, like a centralized or a noble managing the farms, you're basically empowering a large group of people individually to create things that benefit the world, giving them the incentives to do it, letting them have the return on their work. And somehow by harnessing all of humanity in that way, or at least even just Western Europe or America or whatever, just even a fraction of humanity on the globe, you somehow unleashed um, human innovation at a level that it had never been seen before. Right. And the church is kind of coming late into the game. The church starts their social doctrine in the late 1800s, which, so the social, the industrial revolution is a hundred years old. Mm-hmm. Um, they're entering the age of ideology, the age of adamant Marxist, adamant communists, all these even anarchists were, you know, not Nazis and things like this. Like they're kind of speaking into that world where people really, had very firm ideologies and they're starting their social doctrine right then. Right now the church had some disadvantages in speaking into that. It's like, they're saying that the love of Christ, the moral attitudes of Christ apply not only to Joe, but they apply to Joe's people. They apply to Joe's government. Um, that, that Christ's insights need to apply to social organization also. Mm-hmm. Right. The challenge there, though, is that Christ didn't talk that way. Christ didn't actually sit down and write down a plan for government. Mm -hmm. It doesn't appear to have been even on his agenda, Mm -hmm. right? So everything in the social doctrine, in a sense, is a a kind of like a derivative or a conjecture as opposed to grounded very firmly in it, right? And by the way, you'll see books now like St. Basil on social justice. If you look at those books, those titles kind of overstate what that book's about. You know, it's not really a social doctrine book. You know, I mean, the church fathers, of course, cared about morality. They cared about helping the poor, but it wasn't they weren't dealing with the same problems that the social scientists kind of discovered um, at the beginning during the 19th centuries when they started taking notice of it. Right. Another problem that the church has in this is the church is kind of a professional association of philosophers and theologians and moral theologians, you know, it's not actually an association of social scientists. So they're kind of creating the social doctrine without a bunch of political economists and economists and sociologists and people like that commenting all the time. And it kind of becomes clear that maybe that's an issue, you know? And the third reason why I think that there's kind of a problem is related to that is that I think an interesting question is if you brought Aristotle back today or Thomas Aquinas or anyone from the classical past that you think is, um, I guess I I missed just misuse that word. But if you take someone from the past pre-industrial revolution, who's very authoritative, very smart, very wise, and you brought them to today, dropped them in New York city, what thoughts would they change? Mm -hmm. You know? And I think, Clearly, one of the thoughts they would change is they would see things like skyscrapers and realize that that was built with many different investors. It houses many different businesses. It has even oftentimes sold different floors or condos or whatever, right? And they're going to see the complexity of that and how it was never ordered by the president of the United States or it was never like, you know, the emperor of Rome didn't say we're building the Empire State Building, you know. 
that this decentralization, I think, would very much change their thoughts on human organization in general. And um, we need to be conscious of that because sometimes when you're formed as a theologian, a philosopher or moral theologian, you're not thinking like that. You're not thinking about what new information actually just hit the scene. So, Laura, what do you want to comment on this? Sure. Um, well, I just want to add to the list. Did you say you guys, I think you told me you recently read Utopia for a book club. By St. Thomas More. Yes. Right. And it was like, <laughs> there was like nothing to apply or whatever to. to... Yeah. Mo most of his observations were adopted. He succeeded so well, it made his book kind of boring. Mm. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, so this idea that, that, um, like Aristotle or Thomas Aquinas or Augustine would come and sort of be asking different questions. I, I mean, it's like maybe they would have different ideas or maybe they would be developing different ideas um, just uh, because of the complexity. It's like, you know, here in the U.S., depending on what government you have, your local government or whatever, things may be like kind of people might be in favor of a more central government or a more decentralized government, but still like fundamentally our society is way more decentralized. Great point. Yeah. Great point. Yeah. 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 Like everything we're doing now has so much more kind of individual rights and decentralization mm -hmm. than anything, you know, historically. And, and part of that is rights don't come about until there's a threat sometimes. Yeah. So you could argue that maybe some middle ages peasant who wasn't a serf actually had these rights, but Somehow they weren't being uh, protected where he would actually get the incentive structure right and things like that. Yeah. yeah. Everything today is so much, at least in the West and pretty much worldwide, is so much more based on this decentralization. Yeah. And so just to develop that more like um, like it's not all oriented towards the king. Right. <laughs> or like the U.S. government. Right. Like it's not like all our actions are. Right. Um, or, you know, I don't want to say I'm sure. When I say this, someone will be like, the government took X, Y, Z, but like with the incentive structure, you, you can build something now. And if you're like, whatever, whoever you are, you can just build something and you can have it be successful and you can enjoy that success. And yeah. in many and societies, yeah, go ahead. I had a friend push back on this point and he mm -hmm. said, no, because look at Google or look at these amazingly like yeah. wealthy organizations, right? And it's like, sure, look at them. You know, there's like 500 of them. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole mm -hmm. point. There's 500 of them. Yeah. The point is not that there hasn't been like this amassing of capital that yeah. creates like a little power structure. The point is there's like the S&P 500 and they're all very powerful. And if yeah. you go back hundreds of years, they did not have 500 different power centers. Yeah. You know, and you, you can be like anyone can come up with Google. You don't need a certain pedigree or like status, you know, like. The, I don't want to get too much into <laughs> that like, sounds kind of optimistic to me. No, you, gotta I, what kinda, I, what I'm, you, yeah. have, you have a lot of things working for you. you to, to right. Pull right. Off but it doesn't like have to be um, in a lot of societies and currently some right now. It's like if you belong to a certain social class, you're like stuck there. Right. And you can't. Like, even if you came up with Google, <laughs> right, that there's no, you know, there's like, like a caste system, right? There's like a fixed. Um, and I think that was true even, you know, in Western Europe and also even in Western Europe, you could build something, you know, and the king could just take it, you know? Right. Yeah. And I think that this is interesting because just this is an aside, but this idea of nobility, mm -hmm. right? Like, I think that we romanticize that. I even see that amongst Catholics right now, like Catholics are trying to trace yeah. back to see if they have any noble blood <laughs> in their great ancestors. Right. Uh -huh. And I've also, if you've been listening to this podcast, you know, I make the critique that whenever we watch old movies, we always assume that we would be nobles. The no yeah. Yeah. We're always identifying with the nobles and not the peasants, whereas most likely we would be the peasants, you know, this nobility idea kind of started dying with the enlightenment. Right. Yeah. And the Enlightenment is probably what gave birth to the Industrial Revolution. Yeah. Right. And um, the nobility kind of stuck around. I mean, it took a huge hit with like things like the French Revolution. Right. And Napoleon, the, the French Revolution is so funny because it's like they kill all their nobles. And within 20 or 30 years, Napoleon's <laughs> getting himself emperor. crowned emperor. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they're getting a new noble. Right. But like, it's kind of like Downton Abbey is an interesting show because it's yeah. like about the end of nobility. Yeah. Like World War One, yeah. you know, it's kind of the end of nobility, right? 
But the thing I don't think we see is when I think of nobility, it now strikes me that it is like the original racism. You know, like, <laughs> don't laugh. This is serious. No, I'm, um, laughing. But like, I'm laughing because uh, I just watched Chris Rock's special and he was like, Meghan Markle, you didn't know the royal family was going to be racist. They invented racism. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, but it's like point. this idea yeah. that you have like good breeding mm -hmm. and that this family you're from yeah. is like um, this lineage is what makes you better than someone else. Right. Right. Yeah. And maybe it's not in a Christian idea, but it's not like Hinduism where it's like someone's not only better, more powerful and smarter, but they're actually mm -hmm. morally better and, you know, just a higher rung in heaven type better. Mm -hmm. I mean, Christianity has been a very good thing that always was for individual rights where like mm -hmm. the Duke can go to hell and the peasant can go to heaven. Yeah. But there is just this thing where it's like this betterness of certain people than others through this like literal birth. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, mm hmm. It's just horrible. <laughs> um, anyway, all right. Yeah. Let's get back onto this. All right. So um, I thought, uh, you know, this thing that you said about Karl Marx having this kind of dark view that we only did social welfare to kind of appease the working class and delay the revolution is interesting. And I kind of think that that is actually a um, an accusation that's like, level that Christians sometimes like you just do this because it makes you feel good. And that's like, <laughs> you Essentially, know, Essentially, it's claiming that it's for selfish reasons. These people were helping people. And, yeah. and you're saying that that's also an accusation at Christians. Yeah. And I want to refute that 100 percent, except you see a lot of um, like, oh, look at me helping this um, homeless person videos right now. And it's like, this is so selfish. <laughs> Um, and, and it is like actually a thing that we are like when we're interviewing volunteers, you know, uh, potential volunteers, like what are your motivations, <laughs> um, is, is kind of an interesting question. Yeah. So it is, it is actually like a thing that, that needs to be fought against. And right. Yeah. You know, when I hear like the reason why you help the poor is because it makes you feel better or selfish yeah. motivations, I think there's a couple problems. One, you do need to help the poor even, and if your motivations aren't right, do it anyway you still and have try to, to get your yeah. motivations in line, you know, right. it's like being, you know, a good husband or a good wife or a good family member mm -hmm. or anything you have, even if your motivations aren't right, do it and then get, figure out your motivations. But the other yeah. issue is that if you actually think it's impossible to do it for the right motivations, you've also de-justified love. Yeah. You know, right. you basically said that love is impossible. Love is merely a selfish activity, which destroys love, you know? And I think that that's where nihilists go when they really get dark and that's a very dangerous place to be. But it also is as Christians, we can just, we just have to believe in the power of real love, yeah. real yeah. self-sacrificial love. Yeah. So I think we got to reject all that. Yeah. All right, let's get back into actually what is the social doctrine of the church. All right, the social doctrine begins in 1891, where Leo XIII writes this letter called Rerum Novarum, which is basically of new things. Uh, as an aside, Simple House worked for almost a year as a side project trying to get a furniture business started that would make like um, dorm room furniture using people who couldn't get jobs you know, and we were going to call it Rerum Navarum Furniture Company. We we did worked a while on that, never got off the ground. So that, the way you just described that was not not in line with what the social doctrine <laughs> would say. Using people, we wanted to oh, provide right. jobs for people. Um, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, all that. So yeah, and um, all that. Okay. Oh yeah, all that. <laughs> all right. All One of the interesting things about the social doctrine is. Um, it's the only thing I can think of. It's almost always coming out through encyclicals or apostolic mm -hmm. exhortations, right? So Rium Navarum was an encyclical. It's the only encyclicals I know of that have anniversary encyclicals. Like Rium Navarum has had about five encyclicals written on like 10 year, 40 year, 90 year, 80 mm -hmm. year anniversaries of Rium Navarum, mm -hmm. right? And they're basically what do we say at the beginning? This is a tribute encyclical to Rium Navarum with an ascension update. And that's interesting because as Catholics, we usually think in terms of um, timeless truth, not truth that needs updated, you know, yeah. but as the social conditions change, the social doctrines, applications, and the discernment of the Pope on these issues is changing. And that's why there's these like updates, right? 
The other one that gets updated is Popularum Progressio has anniversary letters also, which is also social justice and cyclical. And mm-hmm. I would say that if you want to tackle the social doctrine for yourself, I would start with Rium Navarum. It may be the single best document within the social doctrine. Um, it's the most interesting. It's the most engaging. It's the most direct also. Yeah. I mean, I think it was also the most important, like it kind of represented this new activity the that the church yeah. was doing. Yeah. Right. And I think the question that we usually start with is, is the church communist, socialist, or like libertarian? Yeah. You know? And we also wonder like, um, should the church even be working in this realm? Is it like a contradiction of like separation of church and state? Mm-hmm. You know? And I don't think the social doctrine ever saw it as an issue that it was commenting into politics. It saw it as we comment on human activity. This is a big, important part of human activity. Duh, we're going to comment, you know, on the question of whether or not the church is communist, socialist, libertarian. What you find is from the very beginning, from Rio Navarro, there's a pretty strong condemnation of communism. Mm -hmm. There's also a pretty strong condemnation of kind of like an absolute capitalism, like a complete laissez-faire capitalism. Yeah. Um, But then most everything else, it just gives both sides. Yeah. Right. And when you get down to the big landmark work, which is the compendium of social doctrine, which came out in 2004, Laura and I both read this, but read this like 10 years ago. I I reviewed it recently uh, and tried to get a handle on it again. It's a strange document because what it likes to do is say something and then almost say the opposite, right? It'll say Catholics can believe whatever political thing their conscience tells them to. And then it'll say in the next line, literally like as a group, we sometimes need to discern things together politically. Yeah. (laughs) You know, and it strikes me that you could read this. I, by the way, suggest that if you're worried about the social doctrine of the church, like you have some weird political views and you're worried about it, take the social doctrine compendium and read it backwards. Otherwise you're going to be holding your breath the whole time, waiting to see if your (laughs) ideas get excommunicated. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But what you find is like, say you've got a liberal political Catholic and a conservative political Catholic, right? Mm -hmm. You could tell me all their policy positions the social doctrine will almost never contradict them unless it's like very clear, like pro-life or Mm -hmm. anti-death penalty or something like that. Right. But what it will do is if you tell me the motivations of the liberal Catholic, or you tell me the motivations of the conservative Catholic, it will sometimes tell you that those motivations are wrong and it'll give you a different set of motivations for which you could justify your policy ideas. Yeah. So it's much more a document about motivations than it is a document about actual policy. Yeah. It has like, um, you know, some principles that it asserts, like you can't use people as means, you know, like, um, and the family is like kind of the fundamental smallest block of society, you know, but so it's got like things that it affirms like truths that it affirms like that, but they're not, they're not policy. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so this was commissioned by John Paul II yeah. Just so you know where it's coming from. And it was um, really recommended by Pope Benedict as a great source document, yeah. you know. But it's I think it's like frustrating if you you know, I wasn't that familiar with City of God, but it's like City of God, Utopia and the Compendium. It's like I want the recipe for like <laughs> healthy, thriving, good society, good politics, whatever. And it's like not, you know. It's not that I, I think some nights people find the catechism a little bit frustrating as it doesn't tell them exactly how to live and what to do. Mm-hmm. Um, this is way more frustrating than that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and I like we we read this with another ministry here in Kansas City. We did as like a multi-part book club to mm-hmm. get through the social doctrine. And it was the big takeaway was people just being like, why doesn't it tell me? Yeah. What the right policy is. Right. And that that ministry uh, has like a very different political bend, maybe from a simple house. (laughs) Most people would say they're more liberal than simple. house. (laughs) But um, so that's just kind of this interesting thing. And it makes me wonder if this compendium is actually not a very good document contradicting Pope Benedict now, which is dangerous territory. (laughs) But I say it's not a very good document because it's hard to build off of. It's hard to take away any real good take home points from it. I'm not yeah. asking it to tell me like some policy decisions. Yeah. 
But it should is, I be a Republican or a Democrat? <laughs> right. It never says yeah. that. I'm glad it doesn't say that. But it, yeah. I, I have no problem with anything it says at all. Mm-hmm. But I read it and I don't feel like I got any smarter. I don't feel like I learned a bunch of new tools. Yeah. So I, I find, though, that when you actually take the encyclicals of the social doctrine, you get something much more relevant. Yeah. Yeah. I think like establishing that, you know, you can't see like a person as like a means of production or whatever, like the person has like inherent dignity. I think that was like a landmark thing for the church to say. And that that's like in the social doctrine, right? You don't need the compendium for that. Yeah. Yeah. We just read um, St. Oscar Romeo's um, Romero. work in our book yeah. club. Did I, did yeah. I say it wrong? Romero. Rom- Romero. Yeah. Romero. Yeah. And sometimes he just seems to be saying impossible things. Like he just <laughs> seems to be saying all you people agitating for this kind of Marxist goal, reinvent all of that with love. Yeah. <laughs> and then as like the end of the statement and you're just yeah. like, what? Ah! like, like, <laughs> like what, <laughs> like you just said something like, like you just drop an atom bomb and you walk away. Yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's really hard to like know where to go from there. It's, um, yeah. And there's a little bit of that in the social doctrine in general. Yeah. Um, um, I think a question people ask about the social doctrine is, is it like authoritative teaching of the church? I think, yes, it's just a different type of authoritative. Like the 10 commandments have a certain like absolutist forever and ever yeah. um, importance, you know, right. that, and the social doctrine of the church literally needs updated. Yeah. And it's not like that. an infallible teaching. Right. Which we, yeah. Yeah. So I think that's always been interesting to me that like theologians are often incredibly ignorant of the social doctrine of the church, like Mm -hmm. incredibly so, you know, Mm -hmm. like they haven't picked up these books at all. Right. Yeah. And then social doctrine people who kind of play themselves off as experts in the social doctrine are often incredibly ignorant of theology. Yeah. And it seems like these things should be married and grow together and that every social doctrine person needs a background in theology and likewise theologians just, you just aren't fully formed if you ha- don't have a good mm-hmm. education in the social doctrine, you know, but it just has this different character to it. It has this, it doesn't have the character of like, there's like this prudential character to it where it's like at this point in history, we need to be doing X, Yeah, you know, which isn't very satisfying if what you want from your religion is a bunch of like absolutist mm. moral commands all the right. time. Right. Uh, yeah. Like it seems like capitalism is the best thing we have going right now. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, but they won't yeah. say capitalism will always be the yeah, best thing. Yeah. It's the ideal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Okay. Let's talk about some big picture kind of like issues with the social doctrine that I think that it's kind of missing. I think one thing it's missing is this problem of decentralization I mentioned earlier. I am taking this partly from uh, the economist and sociologist Thomas Sowell. Um, Mm. He doesn't like to talk about communism and capitalism because his point is, what do you even mean? When you say communism, do you mean Russia, Soviet Union? Do you mean China? Do you mean Marx? Do you mean Lenin? Like, what do you Mm. even mean? Right. Mm -hmm. And when you say capitalism, do you mean like some like what we have in America, which we have more social programs in America than communist China has? Mm -hmm. You know, so like who's more communist, America or China, you know, like, so what do you even mean when you say communism and capitalism? So what he tends to like to say is centrally planned versus decentralized, right? Like, are you taking like human knowledge and initiative from the center or are you assuming that human knowledge and initiative needs to come at like a more grassroots level, right? A planned economy versus an unplanned economy. And this is a very kind of classic critique of communism um, that like um, if you go to a grocery store in America, like when I believe it was Gorbachev visited America and he saw a grocery store, he just couldn't believe it. Like he was in the elite class of the Soviet Union, but he could not believe the diversity of products and how much um, in a sense he'd been lied to about what the West was like. You know, that's wild because back then grocery stores had so much less than they have now. Yeah. Now we even have more, right? A lot of it's just branding though, but like, well, no, but even you can buy like multiple types of lettuce at the grocery store, you know? Right. Back then it was all iceberg. iceberg. Yeah. Right. The point being though, that if you would just take one product, there's maybe like, I don't know, 10,000 products at your local grocery store. No, it's more more like 30,000, I think. 
Okay. You take yeah. one of them and just look at the label, the um, container, mm -hmm. the origin, the processing that went into that one thing. That's an incredibly complex problem, you know, yeah. meaning like if you were put in charge of merely producing one of those things and you had to do it all from scratch, that's a hard problem, you know, and there's actually 30,000 of those things, right? Yeah. When I was in grad school for economics, which would have been uh, the late 90s period, we were getting a lot of former Soviet bloc grad students, and some of them already had a PhD in physics, and almost all of them had an undergrad in economics, and they were going into economics to get another PhD. And in those former Soviet countries, like everyone like everyone who was really smart kind of went into economics. That's an exaggeration. They went into things like rocket science too, but, but they had to have these huge economic schools, not to study the economy the way an American economics student would, but to run it, mm -hmm. you know, very different problem. Yeah. Right. And it just turns out it's nearly impossible and it's yeah. impossible to support a large population that way. And that's why you have these, huge famines, like in communist China. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When they had a, de a centralized planning organization under Mao, the number of people who died is a multiple of the Holocaust. That's between 10 and 20. Yeah. You know, so it's just a very hard problem, you know? And so I don't think that the church has really taken into account the problem of centralization, decentralization, and the problem of incentives. And you mean is, by the problem, you mean like the, the, just the moral implications, the moral problems, the everything. Right. Yeah. Right. And when I say the church, I actually don't mean the Pope. I mean, like mm -hmm. when you go to social doctrine seminars, when you hear Catholics using the social doctrine to justify policy decisions, it doesn't seem like they've thought about this very much. Yeah. Yeah. And same with incentives. Like there was a great line from a Catholic worker that is a great rhetorical line. It says, Capitalism is built on greed and self-interest. Therefore, it can never really be a moral system. Mm -hmm. That's a great line. It makes sense, you know, yeah. morally that, but the problem is, is self-interest is not inherently bad. Yeah. You know, and we've got to get over that and we've got yeah. to start seeing and sent that that's what created this miracle of 8 billion people being supported yeah. is this self-interest, but it's also not just self-interest. Like, I need to support my kids. Yeah. You know, I need to support my local parish. I need to support all these things. And I do that by working very hard in my <laughs> self-interest. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think 15 years ago, if I would have heard someone say like, oh, money talks, I would have been like, Ugh, what a selfish person or whatever. I'm like, yeah, that's right. It does. Like now I, I have a different view of that. And it's we act like we're supposed to have these high ideals and be motivated by these beautiful ideas or whatever. And it is a beautiful idea to take care of your family. And there's just like a very practical nitty gritty thing that we shouldn't be ashamed of. You can't ask somebody to like go against their own self-interest or, you know, like caring for their own children for an ideal. Like it doesn't make sense. And it, I don't think it's a good ideal if it is asking that, you know? Yeah. I think also money it's not just self-interest, but it's like, once you have money, you get to choose what you sacrifice it for. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like when the church is trying to build a new school or do some other new initiative, they're basically asking people, is this idea worthy enough that you yeah, will sacrifice yeah, right. what you've earned exactly, to give yeah. to it? Right. And if you, if you're dedicated to not having money, <laughs> like a Franciscan, <laughs> yeah. which is good in that context, you, you aren't the person who will be building this next generation of things and shaping society. Like yeah. That. But, and I think like the exchange of goods, it, it is like a, a way that we show, you know, what we support, what we want, you know. Um, I think what we're demonstrating is the problem. The yeah. problem is it's hard to talk about incentives and self-interest and like the way the economy works and talk about morality in the same breath. Yeah. Because like yeah. we know that the sum total of people working in their self-interest tends to be good if it's directioned well, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's hard to talk about morally because it sounds like selfishness. Yeah. And I think that's a problem that somehow needs, like, I don't think you can have a really productive conversation about social doctrine without that problem sorted out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think like a Catholic person in business, like, I think if they're going to be like successful at their business, what I imagine is they're kind of 
you know, thoroughly formed with the good principles, you know, like I take good care of my workers. I don't treat them as a means and not every step of the way saying, is this moral? I think it's like, I'm running a business. Is this efficient? Is this making money? Whatever. It, it's like the primary question of the, of the business, you know, and then they have kind of these principles. Um, I feel like there's a ton of examples yeah. we could give. I mean, my primary yeah. job is to be at Simple House and to run Simple House, but I also manage some rentals and do some other work on top yeah. of that. And like, I know very clearly that the reason why I'm doing this other work is for, to support my family, Yeah, you know, yeah. but I also know that when I do this other work, I always want it to be a win-win. Yeah. Right, you know, like right. I don't want to trap my tenant in a bad lease. Yeah. I also tell my tenant, I've been, I've been telling them this lately. We're like business partners. I count on you to support my yeah. family. You count on me to make sure the roof doesn't leak and that everything works in your apartment. And we need yeah. to be willing to go into business together if we're going to sign this lease. Yeah. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. And I, I think there's, I like that. Like I, yeah. I feel like that if anything feels like I'm creating a great new relationship mm -hmm. as opposed to anything exploiting, anything selfish or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, Ryan, um, had a property manager tell him kind of early on in our real estate ventures that, um, it's like if people don't pay their rent, you start evicting right away and it does a favor to the person because they know exactly what's coming and it's not like, well, will they, won't they? <laughs> and that was just like fascinating. Um, but it, that, you know, that's been true in our ministry that yeah. like mm -hmm. what you want to do when you're helping someone who doesn't have resources or much opportunity, you want to be very clear how you're yeah. going to help them and the limits of your help. Because if they, if you're not clear about it in your own head or they're not clear about what you might do, they'll keep waiting and asking for mm -hmm. more. You know, yeah. and they won't go search for the new opportunity. Yeah. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like you actually like, like if, if you act like you might shelter them, then they won't go work on shelter. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I, I think that it was kind of interesting because, because this was like, it sort of feels wrong to like, you don't, it doesn't feel good to fix someone or something. Right. But it's, it was like a sort of a sound business principle. It didn't inform the moral. It sort of showed the moral. <laughs> um, I think clearly knowing what the boundaries are is a benefit to people. Yeah. But it also prevents letting anger and other things get into the relationship that are just big negatives, you know? Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's go on one more thing. Okay. So there's a notable Catholic. I don't know much about her, but I know she was a professor at Harvard Business School and an ambassador for the U.S. to the Holy See. And I think her name is Mary Ann Glendon. And she came out with this book in the 90s that I've since, I heard about it in the 90s because it was kind of a big deal in the um, policy debate world. Mm -hmm. um, but recently I finally got a copy, like this year, mm -hmm. you know, like 30 years later, I finally got a copy of her book and it's called Rights Talk. Right. Uh -huh. And basically the point of her book is there are so many divergent theories of rights, mm -hmm. you know, and most of which are completely self inconsistent, you yeah. know, meaning like they don't even make that much sense when you start pushing on them. Right. Yeah. And yeah. the most consistent ones are kind of crazy. Like, like maybe communism, you could say is a more consistent view of rights or libertarianism is a more consistent view of rights, but those get are kind of extreme and kind of nuts. Right. Mm -hmm. And then all these more moderate versions just aren't that consistent, right? And her point is that once you start invoking rights jargon, you start making weird and bad decisions. Yeah. You aren't asking what's good for people, what's good for society and things like that. You're more acting like in this absolutist way and the conversation devolves. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I think the church has to worry about this a little bit because- we don't have a consistent view of rights. Well, we've, we've adopted this way of talking rights. That's like not actually, f it's from without the church. We've adopted this and it, it presents problems. Yeah. And there, it, and this way of talking can be very counterproductive and it's not easily traceable to scripture or anything like that. So, yeah. And I think like, it's like books like after virtue by Alistair McIntyre, like uh, an idea in there is like, <laughs> Do human rights even exist, you know? <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's, so let's recap this. So the three things that we wish the social doctrine did better were deal with centralization, decentralization, deal with incentives in a way that doesn't make them all sound selfish. Mm -hmm. And thirdly, maybe not go down the road to rights talk or get way more defined what you mean by that. Yeah. Yeah. Laura, Heman, do you have a 
recommendation for this episode? I have a very simple recommendation. Um, If you have ever found yourself complaining about the negative content at your library or lamenting the lack of good content at your library, you can just ask the library system to buy the book that you want. And it's very easy. And I just did this for the first time the other day. And it took me uh, like one minute. And it's been working at my library uh, recently. I saw like this is a book that just came out pretty recently. Stories of the Saints, um, as well as Saints Around the World um, in the kids section. And I, I was shocked and happy to see that there. So if you want those books at your library, you can just ask your library system to buy them. That's all. They might not buy (laughs) certain political books for adults, but (laughs) they they won't buy (laughs) marriages between a man and a woman. The kids book. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. They won't buy a book by Abigail Schreier. Um, But okay. Yeah. Anyway, they they have a banned book list at the library. I remember when libraries used to have banned book days. Do they still do that? Ooh. Because can we get Abigail Schreier on the banned book day? event at the library yeah yeah interesting Um, all right i like it when these podcasts kind of write themselves when there's like things to talk about that just happened that you know catholics have an interesting take on uh almost all the news has been completely redundant lately it's just the same type of scandal happening again or the same type of problem happening again uh there was one finding that came out that was kind of interesting Apparently, Laura, there is a natural limit to the number of good days or happy days you can have in a week. Oh, how many is that? I, the natural limit is seven. So, All right, that was a little bit staged. Laura knew this joke. I wrote it this week. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, my recommendation, though, is you tell that joke to someone who's having a bad day. It's like when someone's having a bad day on Monday, you say... It appears you have a case of the Mondays. <laughs> <laughs> Painful to be my friend, I know. All right. God bless everybody. All um, right. Thank you for listening to Simpleton Podcast. Like, share, and comment. Contact us if you got good thoughts. Bye. Bye. Bye.